We're here at the southern section of Herod's Temple, the center of Jewish worship during Jesus' lifetime. Within about four decades of the Savior's ascension, all of this will be destroyed by Roman armies. For many years, the only known surviving portion was the western or Wailing Wall. However, in the late 20th century, excavations here on the southern end would reveal additional features both of the temple as well as additional structures around it. Today we're going to be exploring these sections, looking especially at the southern steps, the gates, and the immersion pools. When Solomon built the original temple in the 10th century BC, it was a site not only at the heart of Hebrew worship, but it also possessed an amazing beauty. However, this beauty was lost when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonian ruler Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. When the Jews were permitted to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple about seven decades later, many of those older Jews who had seen Solomon's temple wept at how poorly the rebuilt, or second, temple matched up in beauty and grandeur. However, God declared that the glory of the second temple would exceed that of Solomon's. It was this second temple whose halls and grounds would be the place where Jesus taught and worshiped. It was this second temple whose structure Herod expanded with open walkways, porches, courtyards, and other additions. He then encircled it with a great retaining wall that expanded the overall footprint to the size of 26 football fields in area. In the Babylonian Talmud, a collection of Jewish oral laws and commentary, it is stated, he who has not seen the temple of Herod has not in all his life seen a fine building. We can imagine exploring the Temple Mount in our mind's eye, seeing all of these beautiful buildings. On the south side of the Temple Mount, we would have seen the Royal Stoa. Now this was a two-story basilica. This was a hall where public meetings would be held, where official business would be conducted. Sort of the same kind of thing as a Roman forum. Josephus describes this building and says it was more worthy of mention than any other building under the sun. So it must have been fantastic. Around the western, northern, and eastern sides of the Temple Mount was a colonnade that would have provided some shelter and shade for visitors. On the northwest corner was the Antonia Fortress, which was built for protection against attack. Now, I think we would have been struck by the grandeur of the buildings on top of the Temple Mount. And I say this because we have just such an episode recorded in the Gospels. On one occasion, when Jesus is leaving the Temple, his disciples turn to him and say, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, I don't think by this they meant, hey, Jesus, look at these neat buildings over here. I think they must have been awestruck at this beautiful architecture that probably rivaled anything we might have found in ancient Rome. When the Jews rebelled against Roman hegemony in AD 66, General Vespasian and his Roman legions began their conquest of Palestine. When Vespasian was summoned back to Rome in AD 68, his son Titus continued the efforts to stamp out the resistance, ultimately leading to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in the year AD 70. The most iconic portion of the temple's ruins is the portion of the temple's western wall known as the Wailing Wall. Here, men and women gather regularly to pray. Above the wall, one sees the Dome of the Rock, where the temple once stood. This western wall is about as close as a Jewish worshiper can come to the temple's original location. In 1968, the Israeli scholar Benjamin Mazar began excavations that would expose southern portions of the temple and the surrounding area that had long lay buried. Large stones had fallen from the temple to cover a series of steps descending from the temple mount to the roadway below. The stonework that had fallen revealed intricate carvings and flowers, 
probably from a gate or column at that end of the temple. We're down below the southern wall of the temple on a plaza that was unearthed during the recent excavations. This particular plaza has paving stones that make it possible for large crowds to gather. They would meet to visit, to learn and teach, and also to prepare to ascend up into the temple itself. In Jesus' time, worshipers would approach the temple from the south and enter into the temple mount through a double set of gates known as the Hulda gates. They were so called because of the reference to the Old Testament prophet mentioned in 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34. The Mishnah says that these two gates were used, one for entry and one for exit, to allow the ordinary worshipers to go into the temple complex. The entire entryway was 39 feet wide and 20 feet high. The remains of a Herodian lintel and arch are still visible above the rightmost or eastern gate. Later, the entrance was walled up, and then during the Middle Ages, a crusader tower was added that now covers the southwestern corner. To reach the Hulda gates, the worshiper first had to ascend a massive staircase known as the Southern Steps, or the Teaching Steps. These 30 steps were carved directly into the bedrock, much of which has been reconstructed today. The steps alternate between those that are 12 inches deep and a landing that is about three feet deep. With these landings, the stairs made a convenient gathering place for individuals to sit and converse. They're sometimes called the rabbi steps because these religious leaders could be found in this setting with their pupils listening and learning. Paul says that he came to Jerusalem as a youth and he sat at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel, perhaps in this very spot. As frequently as Jesus came to the temple, it is also likely that he could be found teaching here as well. The Southern Steps really remind us of the power of Jesus' teaching. It's leading right up into the presence of God, but it's a place where a huge crowd of worshipers would often gather to listen to teachers. And from his teaching at the temple, Jesus was renowned as a teacher of authority, a teacher with power. When they came and arrested Jesus in Gethsemane, he said, I was in the temple every day teaching the people. Why didn't you arrest me there? One other feature of these southern steps deserves attention. With the alternating pattern of 15 deeper and 15 shallower steps, it would cause the worshiper ascending to have to be careful looking down to make sure of their footing. That caused them to approach the temple in a bowed or, or humble position. It's believed that when they would come to one of the 15 wider steps that they would sing one of the Psalms of Ascent. Those Psalms would express both the joy and the sense of privilege that the worshipers felt as they prepared to come into the temple, into the presence of their God. Well, the Songs of Ascent uh, found in Psalms 120 through 134 are sometimes referred to as the Psalms of Degrees. And it's a group of 15 Psalms that Many scholars believe were sung by Jews on their pilgrimages from the lower elevations of the Bible lands and then quite literally going up then to Jerusalem. But I especially like to think of them being used as Jews climbed those southern steps up to the Temple Mount. Now, whatever their original intent, whatever they were intended to be utilized as, those psalms were meant to focus the pilgrim's mind on the purpose of their journey and to prepare their heart to worship God. There were an additional three gates farther down the wall to the east. Though the original structure was destroyed, we can detect certain features that give us a sense of its size. For example, we see these three arches in the wall that were actually added in the seventh century AD. But the total width appears to be about the same width as the original triple gate. And just at the bottom of the western edge of the triple gate, beneath the arch, we can see a vertical piece of molding that was part of the original door jamb. Originally, a stairwell much narrower than the one at the double gate led up to the triple gate. Excavations have unearthed underground storerooms beneath the triple gate. It is believed that this stair and these entrances were used by the priests who would have had available here the needed stores and supplies for temple service. In fact, it is believed that at the base of the large portions of the southern wall, there were a number of small arched rooms, probably shops. Several of these still bear scorch marks, testifying to the burning of the temple in the destruction of AD 70. 
Reconstruction suggests that in between the double gate and triple gate, there may have been two buildings. One was likely a council house, while the other was a bathhouse used for purification rituals. These baths, similar to one found in the Western Wall Tunnel, were an important part of preparation for entering the Temple Mount. The edge of the temple was covered with these immersion pools, or mikveh, that would be filled with water. Long-standing Jewish custom had worshipers go down into the water, be immersed through a ritual cleansing, and then make their way back out to go ahead then and proceed farther into the temple. There are 48 such pools, or mikvot, here near the temple, allowing large numbers of persons to go through this purification ritual before entering. The depth of each structure allows enough liquid for the individuals to be immersed in the waters. These baptistries were filled either by water channels that ported water to the city, or they could be filled from larger reservoirs or cisterns nearby. Also, there were many more of the mikvot throughout the city, even in some private residences, as well as in synagogues throughout the land. With the work of John the Baptist, as described in Mark chapter one and elsewhere, we know that the preparations for the Christian faith involved baptism for the remission or removal of sins. Our English word baptism is taken directly from the Greek term baptizo, which means to immerse or submerge. The Jews already had this practice of immersion in the mikveh, though the significance of this action was different. New Testament Christians were familiar with the concept of baptism uh, because archaeologically we know that mikvahs or uh, baptistry areas were plentiful before uh, the temple and around the temple. Jewish uh, individuals would go through the process of cleansing or submerging themselves to become clean before they went into the temple. And for us as Christians, baptism represents a cleansing uh, before God uh, that really means more insofar as we come in contact with the blood of Christ through baptism, which is an immersion as it's described in Scripture. The act of immersion, or baptism, in New Testament teaching was and still is done for the remission of sins and in order to become a Christian. This is what Jesus referred to as the new birth. That is what John the Immerser taught, what Jesus and his apostles taught. These immersions for remission of sins could take place in a river, a pool of water, or in a structure like this mikveh. In Acts 2.41, we read that on the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 people responded to the preaching of the apostles, and they were baptized into Christ, becoming the saved children of God. Some may wonder how 3,000 people could be immersed for the remission of their sins in such a short period of time. But with these 48 reservoirs, along with many more elsewhere in the city and even some in private homes, there would have been no problem achieving such a large number of immersions. In fact, these mikvot provided just the right structures needed for the mass conversions that followed the establishment of the church in Jerusalem as people were immersed into Christ and added by the Lord to the church. When the Apostle Paul spoke of conversion to Christianity, he described it as a burial, an immersion in which we touch the blood of Jesus Christ. Today, when you or I or, or any person becomes a Christian, we do so in exactly the same fashion. We're immersed for the remission of our sins, motivated by a desire to change our lives to follow God's will. We call that repentance. We also acknowledge Jesus as our master and our savior. In the book of Acts, we find nine different examples of conversion. And in every one of those cases, baptism was mentioned very specifically. You don't see confession, repentance mentioned in every case, even though it's inferred as being necessary, but you find baptism as an essential part of the salvation process that we're, we see in the New Testament. When we're immersed into Christ, we are what the Bible calls a new creature, born again. When Ananias spoke to Paul in Acts chapter 22, he said that he was being baptized or immersed for the remission of his sins. The greatest decision that any person could ever make is to be baptized into Christ and become a New Testament Christian. Through Christ's sacrifice and our own obedience to the gospel, we too can be at peace with God. 
Like these figures of old, we can have the privilege of coming into the presence of the Lord. From the Southern Steps, we're reminded how greatly we need Jesus' teachings to guide our lives. It was here near the temple that the Savior once said, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Every person today should still be interested in hearing and following the teachings of Christ. By his instructions, we can each be free of sin and celebrate being a disciple of Jesus. For the ancient Israelites and Jews, the privilege of coming into the Lord's presence was accompanied by feelings of reverence and humility. Today, the church comes into the Lord's presence when we gather to worship and we praise and magnify his name. But it is no less significant, and we too should be filled with feelings of humility and reverence at the privilege that is ours as part of God's covenant people. You are the canyon and I am a crevice. You are the heavens and I am a star. You are the thunder and I am a whisper. The temple is an impressive, really awe-inspiring structure. It's not only an imposing architectural figure, but its significance is made even more evident when we see the people who gather to this site because of its religious importance. Whether the Jewish figures in prayer, the Muslim adherents focusing upon the mosques, or Christian travelers who are visiting these premises, this temple has been a sacred site throughout the centuries. From ancient times, the Israelites and Jews, they entered the temple to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord. Mothers and fathers, children and older figures all gathered here just as they do today. But what makes it truly exceptional is that Jesus himself walked these grounds. He taught in these precincts and he worshiped here as well. One of the things that we're reminded about from this study is it is not just a casual affair to think of going up to worship in God's presence. I think that's a lesson we need to learn for our own time. People so often make it seem relaxed, even nonchalant, to approach the Lord so that there's nothing truly sacred or awesome about that experience. But it wasn't that way to the Jews, and it certainly was not that way to Jesus. I also found it stirring to see the architecture around the temple itself. You know, imagine what the teaching steps must have witnessed in that first century era. The greatest rabbi ever to live likely taught here. Paul may have learned here. The apostles taught the gospel around the temple grounds. And then the many baptistry pools found at the southern end of the temple, they indicate just how important purity was for the Jews. And early figures made use of these immersion pools to become disciples of Christ. I think of the men and the women, thousands of them, learning about Jesus, coming to accept the fact that He is the Savior, and then making the commitment to become Christians. They were immersed into Christ right here in these baptistries. They entered these immersion pools spiritually dead, and then they came up out of the water spiritually alive, as we read in Romans chapter 6. This is when they were able to say that they were now sons and daughters of God. What a privilege at that point to be able to stand in God's presence as one cleansed of all sins and guilt by the blood of Jesus that they touched in the act of immersion. And all I know to say is thank God for His grace that was offered through the sacrifice at Calvary.